Welcome, friends. Happy Sabbath. It's so nice to have you join us once again for the Sum TV Sabbath School Hour, the Church at Steady. And uh, we have been studying this quarter the book of Mark. We're going to continue on this week in our study of the lesson of the book of Mark. Uh, and this week we will be studying the topic, the last days. Uh, but before we get into our lesson, I would like to introduce our panel for this morning. And to my right, we have Deanna Harris, who is one of our representatives there in the call center, doing an excellent job. Uh, when you send your emails or when you call, uh, Deanna often receives them. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful mm -hmm. that you have decided to participate with us this morning, Deanna. Thank you, Mel. It's good to be here. <laughs> All right. To my left, we have uh, Pastor David Salazar, who is our general manager for Some TV Latino. Uh, and we're always privileged to have you, Pastor, sitting with us. Thank you, Brother Melvin. And it is always an honor to be with you and with Diana. It's a blessing to, to be able to share the Word of God together. <clears throat> All right, before we get into our lesson proper, we always, before we open the Word of God, want to, to pray. And so, uh, we're going to ask Deanna if you'll pray for us, and then uh, Pastor Salazar, if you'll read our text for the morning. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to study your word. It really is an opportunity that we have that freedom, and we thank you yes. for that. Please guide our words in our discussion and help us to represent you in all that we do and say. And uh, please be with those that are watching, and please give them wisdom and help them to understand your word better. And please draw us all closer to you, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And so now, Pastor Salazar, if you'll read our scripture text for the morning. We read from Mark 13, 26 and 27 from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says there, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory, with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the farther, par farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Okay, very good. So um, we're going to start now uh, by reading uh, a small section of the book of Mark chapter 12. And we want to read uh, verses 41 to 44. Deanna, if you'll read those for us. Sure. So verses 41 to 44 yes. of chapter 12. It says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. Okay, Th this, this seems counterintuitive um, that this particular offering is mentioned because it's such a small offering. But Jesus makes a point of pointing out the significance of this offering. And he says that those others who came to the temple and brought their offerings, uh, they dumped their bags of coins into the coffers, um, gave from their abundance, but she gave everything mm -hmm. and she gave out of her poverty. Mm -hmm. And so in the economy of Christ, this, this is significant. Mm -hmm. There are, to me, Two elements that are very important. Well, there are many more, but I, I will just kind of point these out. And number one, we see that Christ sees a woman who's coming to give everything she owes, everything she has. And <clears throat> this he marks, as you well mentioned, as in contrast to those that gave from what they had in abundance. But this woman had this connection, this experience, this um, faith, unwavering faith and trust in God 
that she came and I know that she came and gave with joy, with happiness. For her to give everything she had to the Lord was not an act of desperation, an mm. act of like, well, you know, there's nothing else in my life. Let me see if God is going to answer me. He, she came because she trusted the Lord. And the trust that she had in God to make her make that decision, to give her with, with, with that confidence, the Lord did not pass that over. Mm. Now, <clears throat> this is the first thing that I see in this story that is, is amazing. The second thing is that I, that I see is that, you know, Christ wants us to understand the need to be willing to imitate this woman. You know, he, he, he saw the need of her. He saw, he saw what she did and commended for that. But also he's in the, inviting us to understand that for us to truly be part of his kingdom, we cannot hinder from the Lord. Or all we are to be willing to give it all if it's necessary and in the experience of this woman you know we don't know exactly what prompted her to do everything but i believe she had a relationship with the lord mm. and she was confident that god will supply her needs if she could continue to be faithful in giving to him everything that she had and so today we have to ask ourselves you know is the lord expecting anything less from us mm. You know, God, of course, we may say sometimes, you know, well, I give the Lord my tithe and my offering. So I'm faithful yeah. in that. But are we willing to give everything to the Lord if that's the case? You see what I'm saying? Are we willing to do that? Or are we only willing to give the very minimum? Mm -hmm. And that's the big difference. And I, this, is, this is why I think God is sort of, especially the Lord. Remember, this is actually after the cleansing of, this, of the temple. Yes. He had declared that the people in the temple were thieves a corrupt a yeah. den of thieves you know yeah. but he's not you know he's interested he's in the temple again and he's looking at this and he's not going in the direction of saying you know this woman should not be sending the tithe or their money to the to the treasury because he's a you know he's a mess he's actually recommending that people should continue and to do this mainly because the condition of the woman it was it makes a difference mm. you see it's really what she's doing in trusting the lord and again, I feel that this is a lesson for us. How many are we truly willing to say, Lord, help me to understand what to do with the beings that you have given me. And if you want them all for you, let me do that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts that you have about this, this scenario? So I was thinking that we have this attitude sometimes, I think, that God needs us. Mm. And we forget that God owns everything. He doesn't mm -hmm. need our money. And he doesn't need our talents. Um, he wants us to have a willing heart. That's what he cares about is where is our heart at. Right. And he can find other people. He doesn't need yeah, us. Exactly. And so he cared about where was her heart at. And these people are giving lots of money. Well, he didn't really need their money. He mm -hmm. just wanted them, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that sometimes we have this attitude that God needs me. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he wants you. But yeah. Yes. We, we can reflect on another story that... Um, is similar but dissimilar, having to do with the rich young ruler. Mm -hmm. And and Jesus said to him, you know, yes, you, you, you've done all of these things. You, you, your life looks wonderful, but there's one thing still that you lack. Give, take everything you have sell, and give to the poor. And, and he went away sad because he had much. Um, and so here is a woman who gives everything that she has to God. And here is one who has much, who will not, mm -hmm. who will not. Uh, now, I, I, did, I did a little, you know, uh, I'm not known to be a great mathematician, <laughs> but I did a little current day scenario here. And, and uh, so the lesson says that she cast in two lepta, which is one thirty second of a denarius, mm -hmm. which is a denarius was one day's wage. Right. So um, I said, well, minimum wage now is close. We'll make it good at 20 bucks an hour. That's All a right. lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you go to McDonald's, they, they make just about that now, minimum Some wage in California. That, that, you know, it's close. 
Uh, but I, I just bumped it to the premium, just, <laughs> you know, just for discussion's sake. And if I multiply that times eight uh, and then divide it by 32, it turns out to be five dollars. Hmm. Five dollars. That's how much she basically gave. That's that's all she had. She had. She was dirt poor. I mean, five dollars. Expression. She was really poor. Now I was thinking. Now you know, if if you have a uh, uh, if you have a niece or a nephew or a child, Senator, you know, and you're giving them a gift, and and you put in there five dollars. They laugh at you. <laughs> well, they would ask, what are we going to do with it? Yeah, it's a joke. I mean, you, you can't even get a order of fries at McDonald's for $5, you know? I mean, it's, it's it, how can you pay your rent? Mm. How, can you, how can you subside on $5? It's not a subsistence uh, mm. amount. But it's all that she had, and she took it and gave it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel that this lady had learned to live by faith. Mm. In other words, you know, her life was a dependence of God, yes. in God. And so when she came across or she had this amount of money, she, she put it where she knew would be best, yes. which is in the Lord's hands. And... She faithfully did this, and I believe she gave with a cheerful heart because yes. the Lord loves a cheerful giver, one that is not willing to hold for themselves. And like you mentioned with the story of the rich young ruler um, that we actually had study in Mark mm -hmm. in the past uh, lessons, we know that this individual, you know, the Lord asks him something that he could do. It's not something he, uh, he could never do. Right. He, he had the means, right. and he had to just go and give them to the poor. He would have gained the kingdom of God by giving of himself, putting self aside, and putting and loving others mm -hmm. as he claimed to love God. Because he yes. claimed to love the Lord, but yes. he did not love his neighbor. So that was the, the, the test for him. Now, in this case, in this individual, you know, in the case of the widow, she gives to the Lord. The Lord is not telling her to give to the poor because she's already, she's one of them. But she trusts God, believes in God, gave her a cheerful heart, and I know that the Lord will not forsake her, but yes. sustain her and continue to give her sustain, you know, enough to live and to continue her experience of dependence on the Lord. Yeah. At the end of the day, she is an example of how in the last days men will live. We will not have money or retirement to save us, or, you know, stocks, you know, yeah. or, you know, savings or for one case, none of that will sustain in the last days God's people. Only the living faith. And this is where I feel that we are maybe called today, you know, to start trusting the Lord more and to give with a cheerful heart. Mm -hmm. Not thinking so much in your own, but in what the Lord wants you to do. Mm -hmm. I just... I want to ask you what your thinking is about this, Deanna, because Jesus could have, I mean, he's, you know, the, the last week we dealt with the controversies, mm -hmm. all right, and, and so, you know, Jesus cleanses the temple. There's a lot of corruption going on, mm -hmm. and this woman is given everything that she has mm -hmm. to a corrupt, right. you know, situation. That doesn't seem very wise, does it? No, it doesn't. So, so yeah, I was thinking. How does that play out in your mind? So, he's talking about faith, right? So I think that she had faith in this other way as well. So she had the faith that God's going to take care of her and provide for all of her you know, needs. But she also had faith that God was going to handle this $5 or whatever it was, the two mites, yeah. in the best way that it could be you know, the most good for his work. Mm -hmm. And so I liked how the lesson draw out here. It says that giving to God's cause does not depend on the actions of leaders mm. to have validity. Mm -hmm. The religious leaders of the temple was corrupt. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Jesus did not thereby affirm withholding offerings. So it was very corrupt back then, the religious yes. leadership, as we know. Yeah. And so God wasn't saying, don't give it to the temple. It says, it is true that leaders have a sacred responsibility to use resources in accordance with the will of God. But even if they do not, those who give to the cause of God are still blessed in their giving, as this woman was. 
So mm. she had faith in that way as well, that God's going to take care of this and he's going to use this for his work. All right. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, yeah, the last statement, you know, that, that is made that I, that I wanted to read, it says here, withholding tithes or offerings when leaders do something displeasing means that the giving is tied to their actions instead of being made in a thankfulness to God. However tempting it may be to do that, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a definitive statement, and I, I, I stand with that. It's wrong. Uh, because there are often times that people will look at the, at the church structures and the personalities and the, the, the politics, and they say, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to withhold my tithe from that. I'm not giving to that. And, and, and that's wrong mm -hmm. because the, the scripture says, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse. It doesn't talk about the condition of the leadership in the storehouse. It says, bring it to the storehouse. Because in doing so, we are demonstrating our faith in God. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. as, you, as you quoted Malachi, in Malachi, we see that the Lord declares how corrupt the religious system was. And in spite of that, he says, bring, you know, your tithes and offerings to my storehouse. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that we are to be blind and not to call for reform, to do changes? The Spirit of Prophecy does tell us that we are to do that mm -hmm. in the proper way, yeah. in the proper spirit as well. Yeah. We are not to just be blind and say, you know, okay, well, you know, I'm... I don't care what they, they do. I'm going to just continue. Right. We are to continue to continue give and support the organized uh, church of the Lord. But if we see, you know, leadership at fault, we are to do it and to ask for change, for reform through the spirit and through the ways that God approves of. Yeah. It's not about going off shoot or going, you know, on the other, you know, in your own way. And, and like you said, saying, I'm going to withhold my tithe, because at the end of the day, it's not your tithe. Right. That belongs to the Lord. It's not your offering. It's the Lord's that he asks us to return. I mean, everything that we have is the Lord. And this is the thing. Main thing is that this woman understood that and had no problem in saying, you know what? Everything I have, I am going to give to the Lord. And she gave it with a cheerful heart. How many of us have a hard time in our own heart? And sometimes people that, that criticize the most, the ones that are more vocal about not giving, are the ones, or the ones, I'm saying, I'm sorry, let me put it this way. <laughs> the ones that are more vocal about how messed up the leadership is right. are the ones that do not want to give. Mm. They have the hardest time giving with a cheerful heart. Yeah. They somehow feel justified and they find actually a way to excuse not giving or not being faithful in the tithe and offerings by you know, saying, oh, it's because the leadership is that I'm going you know, to hold my tithe. But that's, that's again, a, a condition of the heart that the Lord sees and says, you know what, you are just like the, like the, Thieves in the old, you know, in, in the time of the temple, you know, you are not loving giving to the Lord with a cheerful heart. And I feel like Diana mentioned, the heart is the problem, is the thing that God wants us to to, to work on mm -hmm. with, the, with His grace. So yeah, let us keep that in mind. What it comes to my mind is the concept of not equal giving but equal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, that that we all give all that we have to the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amen. What, what, whatever the amounts are. Um, yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to uh, uh, the, 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 the section entitled, Not One Stone on Another. And this comes from Mark uh, 13 and uh, uh, verses 1 through 13. And here Jesus is speaking about uh, the destruction of the temple. But I, I think probably we should read it uh, because there are a lot of things in here. So Deanna, if you'll start reading at in verse 1 of chapter 13, to like verse eight, okay, uh, and and then I'll 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 read the rest from there. Sure. It says, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, "Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here." And Jesus answered and said to him, "Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down." Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. 
But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers, now brother will betray brother to death and father and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Hmm. There's a lot in there, a lot packed in there. And it starts out with the disciples uh, looking at the temple and admiring its beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's beauty. And, and, and Jesus has a response to that admiration, which is? I mean, he basically is saying, yeah, this is wonderful, but it's not going to last. It's mm -hmm. not going to stand forever. Yeah, it is, not only is it not going to last, but it's, it's going to be decimated. Right. This beautiful edifice is going to be raised to the ground. Not one stone left on another, which kind of reminds us in the last week's lesson about the fig tree. Mm -hmm. It had its, all its foliage. It was beautiful, but when he cursed it, it was With dead. It. it was dead. Yeah, it wasn't producing, and so it was cursed and it died. And the temple, we know because of the cleansing, and all, was not producing what God had intended. And, and Jesus says, it's going to be raised to the ground. Now, you know, Mel, this description of Christ about, or, the, or actually the answer of Jesus to their amazement of the temple, yes. and how beautiful it was. He asks them about it. He says, Do you see this great building? You see it now, right? It's beautiful yeah. and all that, but there will be no stone left, you know, in this one upon another. It, it sort of shakes their, yes. their understanding. They're thinking, okay, if the temple's gone, I mean, wow, that must be the end of the world. In their mind, it was like, you know, there's no way that this beautiful temple dedicated to the Lord, it, the, uh, you know, the glory of Israel will be destroyed unless the end of the world comes or yes. something happens, you yeah. know. So he, they're, they're asking questions. Okay, Lord, so tell us about, about this. So he, the Lord Christ uses their interest in a temporal thing and in their, their affection to that temporal entity like the temple yes. to startle them and to start thinking about really what's what's at stake and so the lord starts answering and short sharing with them letting them know the events that will come one after the other preparing them to really understand that it's not the temporal things that we are to hold on to or love or put our affection or time into it but truly the fact is that there is a great conflict coming on because he sort of, you know, he mentions about the wars and earthquakes and all these things, indicating how the elements of the earth, I'm talking about the buildings or cars or, you know, mm -hmm. our infrastructure, will collapse. Mm -hmm. The Lord has power to destroy all those things. The most important thing is you have to be filled with Holy Spirit because there will be, you know, tribulation, there will be persecution, people will hate you because of your believing in the truth. And because of all of that, you need to be ready to withstand, test. Yeah. And this is where I feel God is, the Lord was trying to lead them to understand that you cannot be deceived. Be, be careful because the most important thing is who do you know for yourself? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, it's interesting when they ask him the question, he, he gives them the answer. But, you know, in their minds, the destruction of the temple and the end of the age are, 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 kind, to are linked together. They can, if, if this happens, Surely mm -hmm. we're at the end. Yeah. But Jesus doesn't address that that way, but he gives them 
when he does address them, he gives them both scenarios together. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he mixes them in his answer together. Uh, because in the destruction of the temple and at the end of the age, very similar scenarios occur. Mm -hmm. Very similar scenarios mm -hmm. occur. Uh, and we want to talk about uh, the next section, which dovetails into that, uh, which comes from Mark 13, 14 through 18. Um, and uh, Pastor, if you'll read that for us. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, uh, again, Mark 13, 14 through 18. Yeah. But we, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, mm -hmm. and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, and pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Okay, very good. So he says, you know, when they're saying, well, when are these things going to be? And he says, well, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see all of these signs, but now you're also going to see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So he, he goes back to Daniel uh, to talk about this abomination of desolation. Uh, and so I want to just kind of look at this idea. What, what, what is the abomination of desolation? Can, can you give us any light on that, Deanna? Well, I think we should go back to Daniel to see what it says. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So Daniel 12, verse 11, it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Okay. Um, the term also appears in Daniel 9, 27. Yeah, let's turn there. So let's look at that. Daniel 9, 27. Uh, and this is the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, we know. And, and 27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the offering, and on the wings of abomination shall one uh, shall be one who makes desolate. Mm -hmm. Now there's more. Uh, there's Daniel eleven thirty one. Let's look at that too. Daniel eleven thirty one. All right. And, and read that for us, Pastor. And arms shall stand on his part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Okay, so we have these all these terms that uh, we find in the book of Daniel, and Jesus says, you know, that this abomination of desolation spoken of by prophet, standing where I ought not be, is a sign for you to flee. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. What could this abomination of desolation be that stands where it ought not? Well, it's interesting that Christ, as you well said, he, well, you know, points them to Daniel the prophet. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that as well. Christ is telling them also to read and understand. You have to study. It, the, the lesson points out this something that is very interesting and, and very true. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people today when they study prophecy there are those who are historic you know his, they believe in historicism of prophecy then you know uh, then some are uh, futurists yes and don't, and some are preterists preterists so basically they believe is of fulfilled in the past now when they talk about the abomination relation a lot of the common theologians today think that this is in regards to Antiquus Epiphanes, yeah. you know? This happened a couple of centuries before Christ, yeah. and it just cannot right. happen because Christ right. is actually made clearly that this is something in the future, something right. past yes. him. So 
we know that then the abomination of desolation is actually in regards to something that stands in a place that is consecrated to the Lord, mm -hmm. something that comes and corrupts the area where, you know, the, 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 it was declared holy or sacred to God. Yeah. So this happened when the armies of Rome mm. came in the uh, years, actually the first time they came was in the year 66, yeah. uh, you know, um, AD. AD. And this is when they surrounded Rome, I mean, Jerusalem rather, the Roman army surrounded Rome, uh, Jerusalem. And in that time, they placed their banners, they placed, placed their troops in this area that was consecrated, considered sacred. When they saw that, those banners standing, they realized this is the abomination of desolation that this, the Daniel prophet was speaking of, which was a sign for everyone who believed in the words of Christ to flee. Mm -hmm. They had to, like Jesus said, don't go back for your cape, don't go down your house to take stuff, right. you have to go away. Mm -hmm. And that was a sign. Not one of those that believe in Christ's words perished. Yeah. Because just a few years later, in 80, 70 AD, yeah. Jerusalem was destroyed by the siege of Titus, yeah. the general emperor, a, general, a Roman general from, from, you know, from Rome who came and conquered and unfortunately, many thousands yeah. perished in a horrendous way, and, and Jerusalem was destroyed. And utterly, of course, the temple itself was destroyed completely. Yeah, yeah, fulfilling the prophecy. Now, in, in this in this process, we will know that, that, that there was first the abomination of desolation that was set up. The standards were placed to the Romans, uh, but they they left. Mm -hmm. They they didn't they didn't make a siege on on the city. They left. Mm -hmm. And that was a sign for those in the city to flee, and they did. Right. And afterwards, they came back, and when they came back, they came back with a vengeance and destroyed uh, the city. And so uh, this is, this is uh, speaking of the events that occurred in AD 70. Uh, and, but there is an additional fulfillment of this, we will know, because Jesus says, not only now, but at the end of the age. When you read the other Gospels, it's clear that mm -hmm. this is a two-part kind of deal here. Of course. Uh, and so uh, we're looking for another fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. We'll, we'll, so can we'll, I read something here? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so this is in um, Testimonies, Volume 5. It, that's what you're referring to there. Yes. So it says, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Okay. So we can see there's a comparison there. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So there, there's, a, there's a second fulfillment of this abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and then uh, in, in Mark 13, 19, Jesus speaks of a great tribulation. Uh, I'll read that. For in those days there will be a tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time nor ever shall be. And though we know that during the siege, um, and afterwards, even during, uh, uh, during the, the uh, 1260 years, there, there was tribulation. There were, mm -hmm. there were difficulties. But these are all precursors mm -hmm. to the tribulation, the great one that comes at the end of time when, when the abomination of desolation is set up after that. The time of Jacob's trouble. The time mm -hmm. of Jacob's trouble. Uh, and so Jesus is mixing in these uh, prophetic events um, so that the disciples will know what is coming in their day and those who come after the disciples will also know that there are future Amen. events that will happen uh, that we should be watching uh, and, and, and waiting for as well. And we see that there's a connection between who is doing the persecution and the tribulation is coming from where it's coming from. You know, the Roman armies is where 
it was coming from back then. And we see the correlation with the end time with coming from Rome. Okay. Mm -hmm. So very good, very good. Now, uh, in, in Mark thirteen twenty uh, through twenty three, read that for us, Pastor. Mark thirteen twenty to twenty three. This is in continuation to what would happen in that great tribulation. It says, and except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, he had shortened the days. And then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Okay, so here he makes a, a, a statement. Jesus makes a statement about the days of tribulation being shortened, and he gives mm -hmm. the reason. Because this is a great tribulation, he says. Mm -hmm. And the reason he gives it the, for the shortening of that tribulation. For the elect's sake. Mm -hmm. For the elect's sake, because, mm -hmm. but why? Because it was so severe that people wouldn't be able to survive it if God hadn't shortened it. Okay, but, yeah. so. The severity, yeah, the yeah, danger. The, se the severity of it. So we know that this is not directly linked to those tribulations that were experienced. Of course, in the past. In the past. No, so this, this, is, this has to be future. It is, as, as Christ said, there is nothing since the beginning of creation until that time neither shall be afterwards. So yes. mm -hmm. he's definitely pointing out to an end time event. I mean, end of, of the experience of this earth, basically, you know, before his return. It's about the last test of fidelity of God's people. And it's for the elect's sake, for those that are, that are part of his kingdom that are, you know, that we are spared or that they are shortened. Otherwise, no flesh can be saved. And another point that I think is so important is that he also s tells us that there will be such great uh, wonders and signs and miracles happening mm -hmm. by the enemy, by those profess, you know, Jesus or, or you know, false prophets that will be a, a time of great deception, mm. you know, one that will call to your senses and it will make, you know, if you're not grounded in the Bible, in the Word of God, you will be unable to deny the elements that are you're seeing before your eyes, you know, the signs, the wonders, the, you know, the, the glory that you are seeing, you know, yeah. and this is where we know that the enemy will even come as, as Jesus himself. But the important thing is we need to start even today to know and to trust the word of God above our own, our own you know, physical senses. You know, what you see, what you smell, what you touch. If it's not according to the word of God, you better <laughs> put it aside, you know. And, right. and this is something that the Lord's calling us to do. Now, we read in the, in the book, The Great Controversy, and if we've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, you know, it says some of the horrendous things. Yes, mm -hmm. that that have been perpetrated on God's people, those who are believers, and but here it it it, it makes it clear that th those those are the warm ups. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be <laughs> yes. worse than that. Yeah. Th th those are, those are the th those those are the exhibition games mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. finals. <laughs> that sounds pretty scary. That it, yeah, you got some encouragement for us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I think, but I, you know, and, and it's not intended to scare us for fright's sake, but for preparation's mm. sake. That's right. Uh, when we look at those scenarios that were perpetrated on God's people and say, oh my goodness, you know, it's going to be worse than that. We haven't imagined how bad it's going to be. Mm. Mm -hmm. But God has given us that word so that we can prepare for it. And he also gives us an assurance because often, you know, people misquote this section where it says uh, that, that for false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Mm -hmm. It didn't say the elect will be deceived. Right. But it's possible. If it, it, and it doesn't say it's possible to deceive the elect. No, if. It says, if it was possible, 
In other words, for the elect, it's not possible. And the reason, again, is because everything that you will see will sort of tell you or make you believe. If you look at your, if you believe with your eyes, you will say, I am forgotten by the Lord. Yeah. I'm forsaken by God. There's no protection in this world. You know, I'm the only crazy one, you know, clinging to the truth of the word of God. Everybody's telling me, and you know, that life will be better if I just accept you know, these man-made day of rest and so forth. And, you know, you will see the wonders, you'll see the, these miracles, you'll see the signs, the things that, that are going to make to make even, if it possible, be, you know, deceive the very elect. But only those that sustain to the, that's of the Lord will be able to pass through. And this is where I feel that the connection to the very early beginning of the lesson to that poor widow mm. makes a really key element of yes. understanding. Yes. If we can live by faith, we will not be deceived. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. The just shall live by faith. And that little poor woman showed the disciples yes. what it meant to live by faith. She yes. had nothing. Yes. She le- learned to live by faith alone. And ultimately, this is our call, invitation from the Lord. We have to come to the conclusion. And if the Lord is calling us today, I don't know what you may have, what, you know, we're, well, we're not very wealthy. We're poor yes. here. But, <laughs> you know, there are many maybe who are watching who might have a lot of things, you know. The Lord might call upon you to give these things to the Lord. Yeah. And to understand that you need to live by faith and preparation is today. If you wait till then to say, I want to live by faith then, you'll be too late. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I just want to say this, that in my travels, I've come to understand that even though here in the United States, we feel like we don't have much, comparatively speaking. Oh, yeah, we have a lot more. To the majority of the world, we're mm-hmm. wealthy. I'm very blessed. Those of us who don't even have much, or we say don't have much, we're wealthy, yes. com- in, comparatively speaking. Uh, and so, you know, we have to understand that there is a, a time, there's a call. Mm-hmm. And the call is now to prepare for what is coming. Because it's going to be beyond what we could ever imagine. But then God says, what I have in store for you is beyond that. Mm -hmm. I have not seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the mind that which God has prepared for Mm -hmm. us. And so it's, and and Ellen White says, when we get to heaven, we'll say it's cheap enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Regardless of what we endured, you know, the elect, We'll say, you know, while, while we're here, we might say, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, can I, can I do this? But there we will say, oh, it was a cheap price to pay uh, for what we receive on the other side. And, you know, Christ made this interesting, this, you know, um, point in verse 10, speaking of what's leading up to, you know, he says, and the gospel must first be published among yes. all nations, mm-hmm. you know. I, 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 I like the wording that, you know, the, this version says, you know, the gospel must be published. It means there has to be announced. It has to be given. And, and quite frankly, I know that we love to sometimes look at the reports from our, you know, conferences and, you know, what we're doing, how much <laughs> we're getting. But the truth of the matter is that we have not truly reached the world yet. Yes. And it's going to take not just... Uh, you know, the bare minimum of, of giving to the Lord, you know, our tithes and offerings, but it really comes to the point of saying, Lord, am I going to be willing to give everything that I have for your cause? Yeah. And if, if, if I'm not, you know, we have to ask the Lord to help us to look at ourselves and to not be deceived in our own, in our own you know, thinking. Because we may feel that we are good, but truly we look at, you know, our experience, if we have not developed faith, and preparing for that aspect of living by, by truly depending on God, we might find ourselves in a position where we will, like the many in the time of, of, of the Jerusalem you know, siege, will say, oh, you know what? Uh, it's nothing. They came, the Romans left. Right. They just stay here. And those that did neglected to believe in the word of God, they perished. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, the, the reality is that the only thing we will take from earth to the kingdom are, are the characters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we have established while here. And so if there's anything we're holding on to 
that's coming between us and God, we have to evaluate whether it's of that much value or not. Is it worth what 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 profited a man mm -hmm. if he would gain the whole world but lose his soul? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a question that the last generation is certainly going to be posed with. It has to answer. Yeah, we'll have to answer that. And, and you know, uh, just to make a point, is also important in this story to realize that it doesn't matter. You don't have to be rich to give to the Lord. Right. You can be very poor. Yeah. But just like that woman, it doesn't matter what you know you are. You have to be willing to give it all to the Lord, whether it is you know two mites yeah. like this lady had, or whether it's a lot like the rich and ruler. We are called to that to do that. And today is a call to say, Lord, help me to 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 be willing to submit to Your will and put my things in Your service, whatever that may be. Ultimately, you know, of course, the lesson goes to the last and most hopeful experience, you know, which is as you will go into uh, the coming of the Son of Man. But, but, you know, it's important to know that there is a stage in our life in the future, and maybe it's closer than we think, yes. that the great tribulation, a great time of testing is coming upon us. And yes. we are to be ready to encounter that through the Word of God and through having a personal relationship with the Lord. Very good, very good. All right, well, let's move on to uh, uh, our next section, the, the coming of the Son of Man. And uh, maybe, uh, Deanna, you could read for us Matthew 13, uh, starting at verse 24. Mark 13. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I? <laughs> yeah, Mark 13. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mark 13, verse 24. And we'll read to 32. Okay. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Hmm. All right, very good. So now, <laughs> so this section, Jesus alludes to a great event mm -hmm. that's going to take place, and then also events preceding that great event. Uh, and he says that there, there'll be not only tribulation, but the sun darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall, the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then mm. they will see the Son of Man coming. So he kind of gives us precursors to mm -hmm. the coming. Mm -hmm. So my question, have, have any of those things been experienced? Some of them have been experienced. And they have, if we, you know, we look at um, before the great appointment, these elements of the stars falling, you know, this in some areas of the world, the sun darkened, the moon also been darkened, all these things they saw, but they were just as, as, a, as a way to help them point them where, where in prophecy they were. Mm -hmm. Now, the fulfillment, the true fulfillment of these prophecies in the future again, that we will be, because the Bible says that, Christ says, the powers of the, sh of the heavens shall be shaken. We will see things on the, on the elements that we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, that are going to truly uh, be shaken out of its place. Mm -hmm. Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Great Controversy, we see the elements that she sees through, you know, the, through this inspiration of, of the power of God to know what's going to happen. And so we will see these elements in the future. But they did, some of them happened prior to the, uh, the end of the, the prophecy, the 200 year prophecy, to give the individuals at the time enough of uh, confidence that their understanding of scriptures was in the right track. Okay. But well, Jesus then says that then they will see the Son of Man coming mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. clouds with great power and great glory. And so 
Th this isn't something we have to guess about. When these things occur, the second coming is at the door. It's, it, 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 it's there. How is it that people um, kind of discount where we are uh, in, in the prophetic flow? How, how, how does that happen? I think they forget about, you know, some of these signs that have happened mm -hmm. and they don't realize, you know, how much greater some of the things are today. You know, some of the earthquakes and some of the things, I think it definitely is increasing in frequency and in severity. So I think if you don't realize where things have been before and where they are now, you get caught up in current situations and you don't pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and so here's, here's, here's the, the, the conundrum. Things can happen so frequently that you become accustomed and acclimated to them. Mm -hmm. Or if you're watching, if you're watching, they can happen and they can either awaken you to the times that we're living in, mm -hmm. or they can kind of put you to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, well, this is a normal occurrence. Right. This, these are, this is the way it is in California. We always <laughs> have earthquakes, you know. That, that mentality. Yeah. So either either they will cause they, they will be a cause to wake us up from our lethargy or set us, you know, to sleep, so to speak. But Jesus says the Son of Man is coming in the clouds. And that 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 just because we're asleep doesn't mean he's not coming. Absolutely. The sign Christ said, you know, if you use the parable of the fig tree. Yes. You know, when you see the leaves in the tree, the summer is near. Right. So you're seeing these elements, you're seeing these things, you are realizing things are coming, you know, I mean, they're happening. You know the end is near. The call of Christ is wake up. Yes. Wake up. Yeah. It's time to be ready. Yeah. You're saying, you know, you're smart enough to, to, to know when summer is coming. Yeah. Just by looking at fig trees. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are signs that are going to occur in the heavens. You ought to be smart enough to read those too mm -hmm. and to know that the second coming is near. Amen. All right. Well, we've had a great time studying the lesson today. I'm so thankful for the panel I've had with me today. Mm -hmm. We've enjoyed our time with you. And it's our hope that if you haven't made your calling election sure, this is the time to do it. Amen. And we pray not only for you today, but we pray that we will see you in the kingdom. God bless you. We hope to see you next week.